All right, good morning, everybody. Praise the Lord. Up here at the Von Dran Ranch, loving it. That chicken ranch. Oh, Seth's got his chickens. Got the dogs. It's like Noah's Ark up here, man. I love it. Uh, Mom and sis are traveling today. We're praying for them. And uh, pray for all our family, all y'all. Y'all got your needs, and we know it. If I have a need, I know you have a need. And so we pray for one another. We want to lift you high before the Lord. And uh, Vondel's prayed for us this morning, prayed for a blessing. And we're going to be in the book of Psalms today, man. All right? We're going to look at Psalm 1. To, why? Because today we end the grape count of new wine. We are having a fest, festival in our spirits of the new wine. The Lord has poured new wine into new wineskins. He's made us new creations. Amen? Aren't you thankful for that? Because if you were to take the old creation and pour new wine into the old creation, it would explode. You couldn't handle it. And so God gave us new wine skins, and He gave us new cre creative bodies made in uh, His wonderful image by faith, and we know that we're about to be glorified. We've been justified, we've been made righteous, but now soon, very soon, we're going to be made glorified. And I cannot wait for that next step. That's going to be beautiful, guys. And we've made it this far. God's got us this far by faith, for by grace are we saved through faith, and we walk in faith, not by sight. We walk according to His Word and not our own feelings and thoughts, and we praise Him. We praise Him so much for leaving us His Word so we'd know how to walk each step of the way, man. His uh, Word is the lamp unto our feet, the light unto our path, and it directs every step that we take. We're so grateful for that. And then God has opened up the Bible to give us the Bible code here at the end of days so we would be clear on our doctrine. Guys, be clear on your doctrine. God has given you, we saw last night, a wonderful gift. This is an amazing, wonderful, awesome, powerful gift. The Bible and the Bible code. Read it. Utilize it. And much of the church, they won't even read the plain text. And because they don't read the plain text and have a hunger and thirst for the plain text, they laugh at and scoff the coded text. And you're laughing at God, guys. You're laughing at His wonder, His creative power. People don't even have Him in their thoughts anymore. They don't think about God. They don't think about His ways. And we're encouraging you. That's the main purpose of our Bible study is to give God the glory and encourage you to do the same. Don't forget God and all your doings. Praise Him. And Vinyl's put up there, today is day one of the olive harvest and day 50 of the grape harvest. And the Lord's led us. Today, we're going to cover Psalm 1 and Psalm 50. Amen. So let's get rolling because there's some verses there we need to cover and we need to cover well. If you got your Bibles, open to Psalm 1. This is God's songbook in heaven. This is what they're singing in heaven. And you and I need to learn the Psalms here, so we'll be ready to sing right along when we when we get to heaven. Amen. Amen. What a wonderful day that will be. We sang some good songs today, Amazing Grace, Higher Ground, and what was the last one? He set me free. Amen. So praise God. He set me free. Are you free? And whoever the sun sets free is free indeed, guys. You're free indeed. And it's not by deeds that you are free your own. It's by faith you're free, and then he'll free you indeed in all your deeds through his deeds. Amen? Isn't that great? All right, Psalm 1, man. Let's listen to God talk. Blessed, happy, joyful is the man that doesn't walk in the counsel of television. Blessed is the man that doesn't walk in the counsel of the movies. Blessed is the man that doesn't walk in the counsel of those at the water jug on Monday morning talking about yesterday's games and the weekend partying. That man will be blessed if he stays away from the ungodly conversation. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scorners. Guys, it all starts with walking, and then continues to standing and stopping where you are, stopping your walk. Remember last week I was talking about in Genesis, Abraham, God told him to leave Ur the Chaldees, leave his family, and head on down to the promised land that he was going to give him. You remember that? Mm -hmm. And along the way, he stopped until his dad died, and his dad's name meant delay. God told him to leave delays, leave all your delays, leave your family, leave Ur, and get to where I'm calling you. But he said, hey, Dad, do you want to go with me? And you can be my delay for a long time. And then finally, there came a famine in the land, and they sojourned over to Egypt. And, you know, they kind of just, you know, taking their time and didn't trust the Lord, though Abraham was the man of faith. See, he had to grow in his faith just like you and I do. Amen? 
And we have to walk by faith and not by sight. Walk with the Lord in the light of his word. That's how we walk with him. You're not walking with the Lord listening to Christian music all the time. You're walking with the Lord in the light of his word when you're reading his Bible. That's when you're walking with the Lord. Uh, you can't guarantee yourself that these people who are writing your Christian songs are Christians. You can't guarantee that they've even read the word all the way through. You must be inspired by the Lord, the word of God. And yeah, he stopped uh, Abraham and Sarah. They stopped off in Egypt and we saw the situation they found themselves in. If you didn't listen to last week's sermon, we encourage you to do that. When you're flipping through our videos, it'll be the same background as you see here. That was last week's Sunday sermon. What about what's going on in the world stage today? Have you seen all that? Have you seen uh, the BRICS? Everybody's wanting, that's the BRICS banks, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. They are encouraging the world Come to our bank, we'll use the Chinese money, and we'll do away with the U.S. dollar. Well, this week, there was some Mideastern countries there talking about joining them, and we, we know they've already joined. They've already joined in spirit. They just go through all this stuff because everything to them is a ritual. They have to walk it out before they do it. Okay, on the world stage and have the world looking at them. They have to convince the world of a lie. They have to make their set up real. And you've seen, you've looked around and you've seen the Muslims destroying the Pakistani Christians, guys, burning down their houses, burning down their churches. You probably haven't because you're probably watching TV. If you'll follow the heart of God, you'll see online a lot of what's happening and the truth behind what's happening. You'll see Christians telling you the story and they're burning down their homes. They're running their families, chasing their families off and they're crying. We're going to rape your daughters. We're going to rape your daughters. We're going to rape your daughters. All that crazy, crazy Muslim influence by way of crazy Ishmael, the son of Abraham. You guys, that just wasn't a stop off in Egypt. They just did a little act too. Moses or Abraham had 318 guys who were born into his house who were soldiers, who were fighters. Can you imagine how many more people he had? The girls who became the wives. His his servant lineage was humongous, but they were his family. They loved their master, Abraham, and they were willing to do anything for him. And so along the way, they just picked up, you know, just another little servant, a little, little girl there in Egypt who created all this trouble in all the entire world. Don't you dare stop when God tells you to walk. Walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor stop and, you know, sit there in the seat of the scorners. People who laugh at God, people who mock God, don't you even be near them and surely don't stop and sit down with them. And one little stop, one little mistake is not just that. It is now we're having to endure that mistake. But praise God, God's going to save a bunch of them. There's a bunch of people in uh, Islam lands, Ishmaelville, who are hearing the gospel and being saved. And they really will after the rapture. Praise God for that. But that one little pause, that one little, you know, thing that lay over that we thought we were doing good. We were going to Egypt to take care of ourselves and God never counseled him to do that. That's why we encourage you to read the Bible, to know what God is counseling you to do, which steps to take and take those steps when he tells you to take them and never murmur, never complain. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Psalm 1, verse 1, blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor that's, you know, all the music you listen to. Any music you listen to outside of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs are satanic, terrible counsel. Uh, Rick was sharing with me today uh, is the anniversary of when Donovan wrote, what, the season of the witch or whatever? <laughs> Back in 1966. August 26, 1966, and here we still are. England was heavy into witchcraft back in the 60s. They brought us the Beatles. They brought us the Stones. They brought us witchcraft, and the church has accepted it. And now the church is singing those tunes in the worship service all across the United States of America, and the United States of America influenced church in other countries. And God's sick of it, man, because they have not heeded the very first verse of the songbook. The songbook of heaven says, do not walk in the way of ungodly counsel. Anything outside of scripture is ungodly counsel. Your own heart, that's wicked imagination. Stay away from that. Or stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But that blessed man, his delight will be in God's word day and night. 
You, the blessed man, if you're a blessed man, you have understood and realized that the Bible is the only blessing. It's the only counsel. It's the only judgments. It's the only commandments. It's the only word that you need to be applying to your heart and living out in your life on the daily. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in that law he will meditate 24 hours a day. Oh, I'm blessed by the best. Stop, stop, stop. Have you read your Bible today? I'm blessed by the best. Uh, have you watched TV here lately? I'm blessed by the best. The Bible, you, you opposed God and his word when he told you what a blessed man is and what that blessed man meditates on day and night. That's the word of God. Then you're blessed. Jesus is our blessing, and you can't get a greater blessing of Jesus and his presence in your life than his word, his talking to you every day. And then after he's spoken to you in the, in the reading, in the hearing, then you meditate on that. You chew your cud throughout the day, and you remember what the Lord has said, not just today's Bible reading, but yesterday's as well, as the Holy Spirit brings it up. And that delight will be in the law of the Lord, and in that law you'll meditate 24 hours a day. Verse 3. And then that person will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, bringing forth God's fruit in his season. And his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Okay? Now, you and I, the Christian age, our prosperity is all things heaven, all things holy, all things spiritual. 3,000 years ago, their prosperity was living in the land of abundance and what God had promised them, the children of Israel. This Psalm, this songbook was first delivered to the children of Israel and they refused their songbook. They refused their song leader. They refused their God, their king, their creator. They refused him. And so now you and I have that songbook in our hands. And one of the problems with that is the Christians don't even read the songbook. They don't even sing the songs. They don't even familiarize themselves with the heart of God in the matter. And we're encouraging you to do that. And if you'll do that, you'll read the Bible. You'll throw every wicked counsel out. You will be walking in the delight. The delight is his word. And the fruit of that delight is great fruit in your life. The presence of God, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. Are you, is your cornucopia filled with the fruit of the spirit? Is your basket loaded? Is Jesus daily giving you his benefits? I am loaded with the benefits of God. Who's that? The blessed man who walks in the word. Verse four. But it's not going to be so with ungodly people. They're like the chaff of the wheat. The chaff is the worthless part of the wheat. It's the kernel of the wheat that's edible and that you make bread from. The chaff is nothing. The chaff gets the wheat here and then the chaff is worthless once the wheat is uh, nourishable, once the wheat is good for food, once the wheat is tasty, once it's going to bless the man who eats it. Af after the harvest, the, the chaff is worthless. And that's how God sees wicked, ungodly men. You are fruitless. You are worthless. You are tasteless without taste. But the ungodly are not like the godly. They're going to be like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Not fruit, not good. Therefore, because of that, the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The congregation of the righteous are the saved right now. If you are not saved, if you're not born again, you're part of the ungodly. You don't need Jesus Christ. You are not part of the congregation of the righteous. Now, we're not righteous because, look at me how righteous I am. We're righteous because we have allowed God to make us righteous because we humbled ourselves to believe the story of the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection. And upon humbling ourselves to that belief, we say we place ourselves under that truth. We hear the preacher preach it. The death, burial, and resurrection, God came and he traded places with you. We place ourselves under that teaching and believe it. We humble ourselves and say, yes, Lord, I believe that. And upon your belief, you are removed from the congregation of the ungodly, and God places you into the congregation of the righteous, the congregation of the godly. Now, why don't you live that way? Because there's too much ungodliness still being pumped into our ears by way of television, radio, music, gossip, blah, blah, blah. God's calling us to, if you're in the congregation of the righteous, why don't you live righteously, man? 24-7, walk with God continually. Verse 6, we're in Psalm 1-6. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, and he also knows the way of the ungodly. They're going to perish. They're going to die. They're going to rot. It's going to be bad for them. We read Psalm 1 in thinking that God has just begun the olive count. We're beginning the count. God's tickled. We saw that last night and the night before that God is so excited about that we are activated in the count with him. We are on the right page with him. 
There's a lot of people who are doing the counting, but they're way off and they don't care that they're way off. They're just doing a ritual, a religious act. But God is excited about the people who have believed him in faith and who have come over here to his calendar and are counting at his time frame. Today, we end day 50 of the grapes and we begin day one of the olives. Both of those have something very important concerning them. To enjoy the wine and enjoy the oil, both must be compressed and pressed and squeezed until there's no more olive left and there's no more grape left, but just the juice left. And after the squeezing of both of those, what is not become juice or wine is discarded. It's no longer good. And God wants us to look to the time of pressing, our being in a Christian life. If you are godly in Christ Jesus, you're going to have a pressing. If you're godly in Christ Jesus, man, there will be a squeezing. There will be a spiritual bleeding, a spiritual crushing, and the oil running out. And the essence that needs to be pouring out of us in the time of trouble, in the time of our crushing, is everything Jesus. Because that which is inside of you will come out. When you squeeze a grape, you're not going to get olive oil. You're going to get what's in the contents of that skin. When you squeeze a, an olive, you're not going to get grape juice. You're going to get what's in the contents within the confines of that skin. And you and I have, we're new wine skins. God has made us new. We are new creations and everything inside of us needs to be new creation. And that's not the case in most of Christianity today. They still have the old man, the old ways, the old ungodly counsel, the old sitting down, the old standing and stopping, the old going in their own path and not being directed by the word of God. And guys, there's coming a time of, there's coming a time of judgment real soon. And you're going to be rewarded as according to what was in your heart. Not what you displayed at church. People only saw that for 30 minutes, but what was in your heart during the week. And that's why we encourage you, read your Bible, walk in the counsel of godliness. Don't stand in the way of sinners. You stand in the way of godly men. Walk together. How can two walk together except they be agreed? And many Christians are walking with people that disagree with God. You cannot be doing that. We must be in harmony with the Lord, walking holy before God the way he intends. Verse 6, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And they're about to perish very soon. All you Jews... In New York City and the East Coast are about to die and go to hell. And we're crying out as God's witnesses to you, please. He doesn't want you to. He wants you to read, open up the first song in your hymnal and read it and differentiate between the ungodly man, the unrighteous man, and the righteous one, the one who's saved, the one who will be entering the congregation of the righteous. That's a rapture, guys. The congregation of the righteous, we will all, every single one of us, will be congregated in the clouds the day of the rapture, right here during Pentecost. We don't have too many days left, guys. Let's look at Psalm 50, the 50th Psalm. Today is the end of the grapes and the beginning of the olive, 50 and one. We've read one, now let's read 50. Oh, the mighty God, even the Lord. We've got three names of God right there, guys. We've got El, the mighty one, the mighty creator, the powerful one, the all-powerful one. Elohim, God, that's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and the Lord is Jehovah. So the song starts out, it's the first song of Asaph. Asaph was a Levite, he was a songwriter, he was a singer, and he led Israel in many of the songs. And his name means a gatherer of people, it's a rapture term. Asaph is how, how they say it. We say Asaph in, in America. Asaph, Asaph. It means the gatherer of people. It's a picture of the rapture. Every time you see him and his, his singing, his writing, it's about the gathering of God's people. First of all, in the congregation of the righteous there 3,000 years ago at the temple, the tabernacle, then the temple. Then the picture of us who've gone on and we understand the mysteries of Jesus Christ, the gathering, the, the true gathering of the righteous right now is the church of God, those who have been born again by belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ. We will soon all be gathered in spirit. We're gathered right now. Those of you listening to me and those who aren't even listening to me, you're, there, we got other preachers going on. We are all gathered together before the Lord, those whose hearts are stayed on the Lord. There's a lot of folks in church today who's not even thinking about the Lord. They're thinking about getting out, going to have their lunch, and hurrying back to watch their game or to go skiing or whatever it is they do in the, at the river right now in the, in the lake. 
Uh, but there are a righteous small crowd, a remnant, who are thinking about the Lord God. I pray that while you're in church, I pray that while you're listening to this Bible study, that you're really thinking about the Lord God himself. And he's right here in your midst. And you're, you've decided in the first portion of today's reading that, you know what, I, I don't want to be in the council of the ungodly. I don't want to stand in the way of sinners. I don't want to sit in the seat of people who make fun of the Bible code. I want to remove myself far from them. People who make fun of the Bible in the plain text. I want to remove myself far from scoffers. And you decided you want to be part of that righteous bunch, the blessed bunch. And you know that the key is to meditate on the Lord's word day and night. And you've made a choice already before we advance. That's how I want to live my life. You're living spiritually before the Lord. And you've already made confession in your heart this morning before we move on. That's what you guys are looking for. Then we come over here to Asaph, the gatherer of the people. The rapture term, that's what Jesus is going to do. Isn't he? He's going to gather all the people. That's, that's what we're looking at here. And he says, oh, it's the mighty God. It's El, Elohim, and Jehovah. They sp he's spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. Do you hear his voice? Every minute of every day, Jesus is calling out. His word is beseeching. His word is calling on you. Verse 2, is, he's calling out of Zion. The perfection of beauty, God has shined. Verse 3, our God shall come and shall not keep silence. Jews, Jews, please, we're warning you. We are encouraging you. We want you to be saved. We want you to get back in the congregation of the righteous. And you've left the congregation of the righteous for the ungodly. You have listened to your parents, your forefathers, your fellow Jews, and you have hated the Jesus Christ, the very one who is the mighty God and the Lord. You have negated your own God and you've made up a God in your own image and your rabbis have done that and you have followed the way of these losers, the ungodly men who are not going to prosper, who are not going to stand in the congregation of the righteous when the Lord calls us up. And you USA Jews, you're all going to die and go to hell that night when you won't believe. And we're praying that when you Israeli Jews hear this sermon, that they will be an example to you. You'll hear the two men down there in Jerusalem, and you'll hear the 144,000 witnesses preaching the same thing. These guys did not have to die and go to hell that night, but they did because they hated the righteous one, and they hated the idea of standing in the congregation of the righteous and they chose the way of death and hell through their ignorance, through their ungodliness, and through their listening to a different source other than God himself. Continue on, verse 3. Our God shall come, and he's not going to keep silence. A fire shall devour before him. It is very tempestuous around about. When you think of something that's tempestuous, what are you thinking of? The tempest, the storm. We think of the ocean waves. When you see those fishing shows and the shrimping shows and the crabbing shows, you see those boats being tossed in the tempest of the waves. And that's what's going to happen on the front end. The fire, what's going to kill everybody in, in uh, the United States on the eastern coast is the intelligent fire of the bombs, of the nukes. And it's going to create tidal waves, toxic tidal waves, and it's going to kill everybody who's not in the congregation of the righteous, Jew and Gentile. It's going to kill all the ungodly who stand and, and walk and stop and are still under everything except the authority of God. You won't stop and listen to God. You won't walk with God. You won't do anything with God. You won't accept him. You hate him. And therefore, you remain in the counsel of the ungodly and in the gathering of the ungodly. And as soon as God gathers us up, asafs us, the gathering of the people, Jesus is going to call all those who are in the congregation of the righteous, and those are the people who've accepted the righteous one, Jesus Christ, and his shed blood, his death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. Everybody who's believed in that for their own eternal existence will be caught up and saved when Jesus comes and he brings the tempest, the tempestuous sea, and he's going to kill everybody with his weapons of mass destruction, his creation. His creation will destroy his creation. Verse 4. And, and guys, guys, well, let's make a note. That's the beginning stages. The beginning stages is the tempestuous water. The ending stages is this fire that he first mentions in Jerusalem. He's slowly coming after you survivors who survived this first night. He's going to get all the ungodly. Jesus Christ is going to wipe out all the ungodly, those who are not in the congregation of the righteous. And you have every opportunity to come back into the congregation of the righteous. 
but it's by way of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. There's no other way. There's no other door. There's no other uh, way to get to the heart of God. There's no other way to come to heaven except through Jesus Christ. And you must understand. You say, I don't like Jesus, but I love Jehovah. That's what Jehovah was proving the point. I have come to you in the flesh because humans were in trouble and I, God, became human to die in your human place because humanity was doomed and cursed and Jesus Christ was the ultimate human and he took all the curses and the damnation of humanity upon himself and the Father rifled out his anger and rage and wrath upon him to save us from it if we would believe. And only those who believe are in the congregation of the righteous. The rest of you are in the counsel, the wickedness of the ungodly. And he's coming to kill you. And he's going to start with all the Jews. He's coming after you Jews, people. You guys, you go to synagogue, you go to temple, but you haven't come to him. You haven't come to Calvary. And God calls your religion vain and empty and worthless, and it makes him nauseous. And he's calling you to be saved today. And we're crying out here in the middle of the street as as God's men, as his prophets, as a Jeremiah saying, will you please believe the judgment is here. The bow has left, or the arrows left the bow, man. He's coming after you. He's coming after the ungodly. Please remove yourself from that target and become part of the godly. Become part of the righteous. Be saved today. Believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Believe that almighty God, El, the great creator, Jehovah, left heaven and came here to earth in the form of a little baby to die for you. Will you please believe this? Will you please read the book of Matthew and understand that Jesus wasn't a Christian? He was a Jew. And he was a Jew. He's the king of the Jews. Please read the book of Matthew, please. And we encourage you to expedite your reading. You read it quickly because Jesus is coming quickly and he's going to kill everybody in the ungodly picture on the East Coast here shortly. And then he's going to work his way to the entire world Ending over there in Israel, we want you all to be saved. Verse 4. He shall call to heaven, uh, to the heaven above and to the earth, that he may judge his people. His people. He's coming to judge his people who have not declared him to be their God, who've refused him as their God. He chose you Israelites as the elect. He chose you when he chose Abraham from last week. Leave Ur of the Chaldees. Come out of her. Don't go back to Egypt. Trust in me in the time of trouble and famine. And you have not. And Jesus is calling you back to his congregation. The only reason he's doing this is to win you back. And two-thirds of you, you know this, in the book of your Zechariah, are going to have to die as ungodly ones. God didn't want that. He's already invited you over to the congregation of the righteous to leave the way of wickedness and unrighteousness and unbelief. God hates your unbelief, your unbelief. He, he hates your unbelief, especially when it's mixed with religion. Judaism and unbelief is just a putrid, rotten smell in the nostrils of Almighty God. And he wants you to come out of that and be a sweet savor. And this sweet savor is found only in the burnt offering of Jesus Christ. That is the only sweet savor that God adheres to, is when you find yourself in the middle of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ in the middle of you and you believing the story that God left heaven and came here and died for you. Verse 6, here's Asaph saying, gather all the saints, gather all the saints. He's singing his own name. Gather the congregation, gather the people, gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me with sacrifice. And the heavens shall declare the righteousness, for God is judge himself, and he knows who are righteous. We saw that in Psalm 1. He knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. He's going to bless the way of the righteous. He's going to rapture the righteous, and he's going to destroy the wicked. He already told you that in your first song. Now we're in song 50, the first song of Asaph, the first song of Asaph, where he's the gathering of the people. And right here in verse 5, he's talking about the gathering of the people together, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Now, you and I in the Christian age, we have not made a covenant with God. What we have trusted in is the covenant that the Son made with the Father. I will go, I will die, I will be their propitiation, I will be the Savior, I will be the one. My shedding of blood, without the shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness, and I'll go shed my blood. And that's what covenant means, is the cutting. You cut yourself with a knife, and there's the shedding of blood. You slit the animal's throat, and there's shedding of blood. The covenant means the cutting, and Jesus and the Father made that cutting together. They made that covenant together. And you and I, we find ourselves whether we're going to believe that 
And if you believe that, you are now in the congregation of the righteous. If you refuse to believe that, you remain in the counsel of the ungodly. You remain in the congregation of the wicked. God's calling you out of the congregation of the wicked. And there's many people who have placed their faith in the covenant of Jesus and the Father. And you still live wicked. You still adhere to ungodliness. You still watch wickedness on TV. Your pay-per-views are satanic. And you were watching whoredoms. And you were watching prostitution. And you were watching fornication. And you love to have it so. And you pay for next week's version of it. And these series that you watch. And God's sick of it, man. Come out of her, my people. Come out of the wickedness. You who claim you're part of the covenant. You who claim you're believers in the covenant. Continuing on here. Verse 7, we are in Psalm 50, verse 7. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, he's talking to you, Israel. God is talking to you here, and we encourage you to listen. Hear ye what the Spirit is saying to the Jews. I will not reprove you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings to have been continually before me. He says, I am God, even your God. He's talking, let's read that again. I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against you. God is against you right now, Israel. He's not for you. This temple that they're about to build is not for you. It is satanic. It is for Barack Obama and the devil. Satan wants to usurp God's place, and you have allowed him to through your unbelief. You have refused the Holy One of Israel. You have refused God, Jehovah, the El, the Elohim, the Almighty One, Jehovah. In Jesus Christ, in flesh, you've refused him. I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings to have been continually before me. I will take no bollock out of your house. That's bull. The word says this, I'm not going to take no bull from your house. That's what it says. I am not going to take any more bull, any more lies, any more of this. Oh, I made a covenant with God. We're Jews. We, 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 we are righteous Jews. We go to synagogue. We go to, we worship on, on our Sabbath. And, and, and God says, I'm sick of your bull. I am no longer going to take any bull from your house, man. You're lying. You have refused my truth. Had you followed me all the way through, you would have been believing in Jesus Christ as your Messiah already. But you have refused and you have hated what I have counseled you. Verse 9, and I will take no bull from your house, nor he goats out of your folds. He says, you guys are still having your sacrifices. And they, they aren't right now, but they're about to. They're about to build this satanic temple. They're about to reinitiate animal sacrifice. And they're going to be thinking they're so holy and ritualized, and they're opposing God. And God said, I hate your bulls. I hate your goats. I hate your sacrifices. Because of one Jesus Christ, the final sacrifice, you must now not have a physical slitting of the throat and a physical burning of fire, but you must trust in the fact that Jesus shed all of his blood and the Father burnt the sacrifice up on that cross for your sake and my sake, and we must believe by faith. Verse 9, I'm not going to take any more bull out of your house. I'm sick of your bull, your goats, all your sacrifices, everything you think you're doing for religion. Verse 10, for every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills is mine. I do not need your stuff. You need my stuff, God says. What I'm offering to you is the absolute best, my very self, my very only begotten son, and you have refused him. And what does he say? He's got the, he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Harry A. Ironside, old preacher from the past, preaching the truth, for by grace are you saved through faith alone, man. One day they were, they were needing money for their seminary, for their college. They were preaching college boys. Back then, this particular seminary was preaching the grace of God. They were preaching the fire of God. And like every other seminary, Satan got in there, brought his own teachers, brought other forms of the Bible, the NASB and the rest of them, and have taken all the glory away from God, his word. They've snatched the fire out of his mouth, out of his heart, and men are now believing lies. But back in this day, they were needing some money, and they were all in a prayer meeting, and Harry Ironside said, Lord God, you own the cattle on a thousand hills, Will you please just sell of some of them and give us the money from that? That very day, the secretary came to Harry A. Ironside and dropped a check down on his desk and said, the Lord sold some cattle and we got the exact amount we needed. A rancher had sold two trailers full of cows and the Lord laid it on his heart to give it to the seminary. Wow. 
And it was according to exactly the prayer, according to this passage, that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I don't need the little cow in your fence. I don't need what you have to offer. You need what I have to offer. And God will supply all our need and take care of us at every angle. Guys, do you believe that? Yes. I believe that. Continuing on here, it says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Everything is mine. The forest is mine and the hills are mine and the cattle on those hills are mine. Verse 11, and I know all the fowls of the mountains. God says, I know Seth's chickens. I know where they are, all the fowls. I know where every one of them are. And the wild beasts of the field, they're mine too. If I were hungry, God says, I would never, ever tell you about it. For the world is mine and the fullness thereof. God says, I got enough to take care of me. You must realize that you're hungry and you're thirsty and you need what I got, says God. And you haven't recognized that this is a song. This is a song sang in heaven and it used to be sung in the temple. And while they were singing it in the temple, it just became a ritual to them. Yeah, God owns everything and I need what his and he don't need anything that's mine. Blah, 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 blah. And they felt because of their religious act that they were cool with God, especially because I'm down here in God's building that he told Solomon to build. Yeah, in Herod's building. Oh, we're, we're fine with God because we're in church today. And that's the deception, guys. Religion is the deception of the ungodly. And they're pumping that into your heads. You show up today, you give your tithe, you live this way, and God will be happy with you. And God is not happy with anybody who's refused Jesus Christ in their life as their only way to heaven. And they have listened to the ungodly, and they've sat down at the seat, the table of scoffers. And they have not listened to the pure, holy word of God. And we're encouraging you to be a different people than that. Get out of the congregation of the unholy, and you come over here in the congregation of the righteous. You can only be made righteous in your belief in the death, burial, and resurrection of the final sacrifice, not this bull that's coming out of your house in your synagogues today. These lies. God says, man, I'm not, if I were hungry, I wouldn't have to tell you because I, I know where my chickens in the mountains are. I know where my fowls are. I know where my goats are and my cows. I don't need what you got. You need what I got. Verse 14. Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay your vows unto the Most High. God's looking for a real heart of praise, a real heart of fellowship, a real heart who honors him. That's what he's looking for today. Stop right here in this house, guys. What is God seeing in your heart? Is he seeing that? Is he seeing a holy heart separated unto him? A holy heart that is so thankful to him for all his goodness. And Lord, I don't have anything I can offer you. And you've offered me everything, and I am so thankful for that. I am so grateful for that. Is that your heart today? That's what God said right here in this verse that he's looking for. And I hope he found what he's looking for in this living room. And I hope he found what he's looking for wherever you are. Verse 14, we are in Psalm 50, 14. Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay your vows unto the Most High. And call upon me in the day of trouble. I'll deliver you. You'll glorify me. The people in New York City are not going to have the opportunity to call on God. God will have allowed them to go to sleep for the last time, and they'll never wake up again. When they open their eyes, they'll open their eyes like Michael S. Heiser in hell, and they'll be perplexed and freaked out. But Jesus, weren't we your people? Weren't we the people called by your name? Didn't we live humble lives? When you disobey God... You will be deceived thinking you're still humble when you're not. The proud, God resists the proud. And who's the proud? Those that resist God. Those that resist the word. Those that resist his teaching. Those that resist his heart. You are proud and God is not going to have mercy on you in the day of trouble. But what's going to happen is the people in Israel, the Jews in Israel and around the world, are going to see all the Jews slaughtered on the East Coast. And they'll begin to call on the name of the Lord. And he promised in this passage, in this wonderful song of the gathering of the people, that he will gather you together. Because there's coming a gathering of the people at the mid-tribulation point where God is going to hide everybody who flees from Judea. Everyone who flees from the temple. And the setup is being set up right now. God's going to allow you to have a visual to watch all the Jews in the east coast of America die and go to hell that night. So you'll have time to call on the name of the Lord. And he says, when you call on me, I'll come running. And you better believe the prophets that are going to be preaching down in Jerusalem. You better believe my voice right now. We would love for you to be in the first gathering, the mystery gathering, the gathering that wasn't talked about. 
until Paul come along. That's the great, wonderful, awesome rapture of all of us who are saved in Jesus Christ. We've humbled himself. We've given up every wicked part of our heart to believe his truth. I believe in your death, burial, and resurrection, and you died for me, and you are the price tag that it takes to get to heaven. And when I believe, your righteousness comes inside of me. And that is the price tag that the Father, the only price tag that he'll receive, the free ticket. Do you have that wonderful ticket from the Lord Jesus Christ? What is he seeing in your heart right now? God's looking for hearts along the way. That's how he found David. He looked among all the mighty men, and then he found one shepherd boy who was out there with his sheep in the middle of nowhere. He could have been doing any kind of sin, any kind of paganism, any kind of false counsel, but he was there loving the Lord God and singing to him and singing his songs, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in his heart to the Lord. And God said, that's my guy right there. And that's what he's looking for today. He's looking for his guy and his gal who is filled with the heart of the Lord, the word of God, Amen. and singing it back to him, giving it back to him. Verse 15, and if you'll call upon me in the day of your trouble, I will deliver you. Uh, not that first batch, because they will not have had opportunity. They're going to be the show and tell. They're going to die and go to hell that night, and then the preachers will be preaching. Hey, you saw that group that was gathered to the heavens. They were gathered to the congregation of the righteous the same night the ungodly were slaughtered by God's tempestuous sea. It's coming your way next and it will end in fire, just as God sang it in Psalm 50, just as they're singing it in heaven in Psalm 50, just as we'll be singing it in heaven here shortly, just as we're singing it today as we preach it to you from the heart of God, sing his songs and his praises and the fire is coming. And guys, if you'll listen to my voice, you will be saved. Even now, even you Gentiles, if you'll hear my voice and be saved and come out of your denominations, come out of your religion, and come out of all the things your Pentecostal holiness preacher said to do, if, you will, if you'll if you wear long sleeves, God will be happy. If you keep your hair short, God will be happy. If you women keep your hair long, God will be happy. If you women won't wear makeup, God will be happy. And you're going to come out of those lies because they're all lies. God's not happy in Anybody who hasn't placed their faith in Jesus Christ and trusting in him alone to take them to heaven. Yeah. Believe him today. The fire's coming and he will not have mercy. But today he'll have mercy. Harden not your hearts. Harden not your hearts and listen to him. Verse 16. But unto the wicked God saith, what hast thou to do to declare my statutes? Or should I say my covenant in your mouth? You wicked churches, you wicked hearted folks, you got your Bible in your hand. You're at the church, the smoke lights and mirrors. You're hearing the preaching and I am not in your thoughts. You have not believed in me only for your salvation. You're trusting in yourself for your salvation. You're trusting in your goat and your bull at your house. For your salvation, God says, I don't deal with bull. You better deal with righteousness. You better deal with truth. Verse 17, seeing that you have hated instruction, the word. You hated my word. You cast my words behind you. Ah, whatever. Pfft, the word of God. I don't got time to read that crap. I got t tons of television to watch. I got softball. You guys don't, don't you know that softball tournaments this weekend? That's probably seven games if we're on a roll. I don't got time for God. Okay, you better have time for God and you better not throw his words behind you back because God says he calls you ungodly and wicked. If you do that, if that's the way you think and that's the way you believe, verse 17, seeing that you have hated instruction, the word of God, you've hated preaching, you've hated godly preachers who are preaching only the truth, who are preaching my songbook as my songbook, and you have taken my words and you cast them behind you. Who cares about that crap? I, I, I got to roll, and they're all behind you, and you're headed that way, the opposite direction. Verse 18, when you saw a thief, then you uh, contend us with him, that he, you may be partaker with adulterers. you given your mouth to evil, and your tongue frameth deceit. He says this right here. You've hated my instruction, and you cast my words behind you, and you commit the eighth, the seventh, and the ninth commandment, you sin against all three of those immediately, which is what? Do not steal, do not commit adultery, and do not lie. And you guys do that constantly. What do you say we steal? 
Well, you don't give to God. God told us, he gave us a wonderful principle on, on what God expects on the three harvests. When you read Leviticus 23 and other passages in Leviticus, he tells us how to harvest a field. Now that field is your life. The first part of our field, the first part of our life goes to God. We give him everything. Lord, this is yours. And then we take the portion that God has given us to help us live and to pay our bills and to take care of ourselves and our family and to look after the things of heaven. And we leave the four corners. We have enough left in our budget to give to those that are hurting, those that are hurting for certain. God says he'll bless and honor that. And the, the church, the Christian church today has not done that. We take all the money for ourselves and we will save for a vacation for me. And there's no giving to God in the middle, the first portion, the first highest heap. And there's no saving for the strangers and the widows and the orphans. There's none of that. It's all for me and mine, me and mine, me and mine. And you're breaking the very, very heart of God in breaking the commandments of God. Now, those commandments were for the Jews. Do you guys know that every commandment that God gave the Jews, there's a principle in, in there for you and I, the Christian, to adhere to? that's showed and portrayed in the New Testament of God. It's, it's all about a characteristic or a characteristic flaw that you have and share. And God's called us to whatever he has given us, provided us in our field, our life, is to take care of the things of heaven, give to God, and save enough for other people who could be hurting here later. And that's what God, God has called us to in the American church. He hadn't done that. And then he calls you wicked upon that. And he says, and by the way, you must know that daily you break the eighth, the seventh, and the ninth commandment. But I have this adultery thing. What's that? What kind of TV do you watch? Is Jesus your number one or something else your number one? You're, you're a spiritual adulterer. God's calling you into absolute holiness, absolute righteousness. And they're singing this in heaven right now. Don't you know that they are counting day one and day 50 in heaven? Don't you know that we're very fortunate to be on their day count and what they're up to. And today they're honoring day one and day 50. Today they're honoring, uh, turn your hymnals, people in the book of Psalms, turn the Psalter to number one and number 50. We're going to be singing those today. I got no doubt in my mind that they might be doing that for the Lord laid this heavy on my heart today yeah. for it's day one and it's day 50. Had you, have you adhered to this? There's some powerful stuff in song number one, and there's some mighty powerful stuff in Psalm number 50 as we continue. Verse 20, you sit and you speak against your brother. You talk about your true brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. Make fun of them instead of praying for them. We're told to pray for our enemies and you're slandering your brother. God says, I hate that with a passion, man. God calls that assassination. God calls it murder. When, when you take out someone's character, you are murdering that person for that character is that person. When you say somebody's name, you think of their character immediately. And for you to assassinate a brother in Christ is for you to murder a brother in Christ. And Jesus Christ hates that with a passion. Uh, you slander your own mother's son, even your physical family. <laughs> Guys, uh, some of my mother's sons are some rough bunches. Rough bunches. Jesus can save to the uttermost. Amen. He could change a heart in one day, in one moment. And we pray to that end. Lord, I may have a brother or sister that's a scallywag, and they are. They're sinners. They're in the seat of the ungodly. They're everything you said here in Psalm 1 and Psalm 50. But I know you can save them. I know you already paid for the price. Please have them realize this and confess this and lower themselves, humble themselves below this truth and believe it. Will you please do that? Instead of just wasting your day condemning them and damning them to hell, why don't you pray for them that God will save them from hell? Come to heaven. Verse 22. These things hast, hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether as, just like you. While you were sinning, while you were committing adultery, while you were stealing, while you were thieving, while you were just lying and talking negatively about your brother, while you were slamming him down, you thought I was cool with it because I didn't say a word. You have mistaken my patience for acceptance, God said. Guys, don't you dare accept God's patience as his acceptance. He
He hates sin. It's all mentioned in the Bible what he hates. He tells you what the ungodly are up to and he tells you what the righteous are up to. And it's up to you to find that out and say, Lord, please, I only want to be part of the righteous, the congregation of the righteous. I want to please your heart. I don't want to suppose anything. Just because you've been quiet and not have pointed me out in my sin, I don't want to think that I'm, I'm good and you're okay with it. Help, help, help me to know, Lord. I want to know. I want you to find when you seek for my heart, I want you to find what you found in David's. I want to be a man, a woman after your own heart. I want you to be all my heart. I want you to fill my soul, you to fill my thoughts, you to fill my everything. I want your word to saturate every part of my being, every point of my day, every nanosecond. God, please. You know, he loves praying like that. He'll answer prayer like that because that's according to his will. But you thought that because I didn't punish you right away for your wickedness that I was cool with your wickedness. Oh, his grace covers that. Yeah, I'm, I'm walking in his grace. His grace covers that. I, I get a sin all day long because his grace covers that. Paul already told us that that is not the heart of God. And he says it's something that God forbids. God forbids that kind of thinking. Oh, what shall we say then? Shall we go ahead and keep on sinning because Jesus has already paid for it? Because sin is no longer an issue? I'm going to go ahead and sin. God says he hates that kind of thinking. He forbids that kind of thinking. That's Romans chapter 6. And you thought because I kept silence that I was cool, with it, that I was altogether just like you. I was one of the boys. God continues, but I will reprove you and set them in order before your eyes. I'm going to straighten this whole thing out. And Israel, they're over there thinking they're fine with God because they've had it great. Uh, everybody here since World War II, since the terrible Holocaust, and many people turned their hearts on God because, you know, all those people that were killed in the Holocaust. Do you guys know that that wouldn't have happened if they had Jesus? Do you know that? Because the, the people in Christ Jesus, there were a lot of Christians that died, but there wasn't six million in concentration camps that died. God allowed that to happen because these people were outside of his blessing. I'm telling you, man. And these two thirds of Israel that he's about to kill is outside of his blessing. He's going to save those that are inside of his blessing. His blessing is Jesus Christ. You better find yourself in that. And Christian, I'm talking to you right now. You better find yourself in the Presence, the blessing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Get yourself in the Word of God. Read 10 to 20 chapters every day. Saturate your heart. Soak in this thing. Marinate in the Word of God. Know His ways. Know that when He's quiet, it doesn't always mean His acceptance. You'll read that in you know about a day or two. If you'll read those 10 to 20 chapters, you'll finally come across the point to where God will point out your sin and He'll reprove your sin and give you the opportunity to quit sinning and to walk in His righteousness. Please read the Word of God and then read that Bible code. Familiarize yourself with that Bible code. And because I kept silence, God said, you thought I was one of the boys. I was, I was cool with you. Oh, my grace will cover that. God says, I hate that. Verse 22, now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you into pieces and there be none to deliver. How many of you all think that a tsunami a mile high going 600 miles an hour will be tearing some folks to pieces? God's about to come and do just what he said he would do because you have not hearkened unto his voice. You have not listened to him. You've not walked in his word. You've listened to your stupid rabbis who themselves will be torn apart that night on the East Coast. Now consider this, ye that forget God. You all have forgotten God. You Jews who are of the synagogue of Satan, you Jews who hate Jesus Christ, you have forgotten God because Jesus is God. And we're crying out to you right now in warning. This is not hatred. This is will you please understand what God is telling you in your songbook. Please. He's coming to tear you apart. But you don't have to be part of that. You can be part of that asafe, the gathering of the righteous, because you were part of the congregation of the righteous, because you became part of the believers in Jesus Christ. And we're a very small congregation, but we're righteous and the rest of you are not. Because we've been made righteous in Jesus Christ because we did what he said, which was believe. The command of God right now to everybody is believe, believe, believe in his wonderful work that he did at Calvary on our behalf, that he purchased our redemption. Yeah. And if you'll believe that, you'll have a free ticket to heaven. Until then, God's coming to terrorize you and rip you apart. And it will start in the United States of America, and they're going to blame it on aliens. They're not going to allow God to get the glory for ripping you apart, for having stuck true to his word. 
Obama's going to take that away from God as fast as he can, but we're encouraging you to believe it. When you see all these people die in New York City and the East Coast, and they start blaming it on the aliens, that you will hear this preacher, and you will not deny God his glory, and you will come to understand that it was God who destroyed these people and tore them apart. And you'll repent, and you'll become part of the congregation of the righteous, and God will gather you at mid-trib in Israel, if you'll believe God wants to save you. He's always about saving. And those who refuse his salvation and throw his word behind their back and don't care what he says and just feel frivolous about breaking the, you know, eighth, seventh, and ninth commandment, destroying my brethren who I should be praying for. Just as I'm coming after you. Now consider this, he says. You that forget God, you that won't believe in Jesus, not believing in Jesus is forgetting God and his plan of salvation. Lest I tear you in pieces, and there will be none to deliver you, none to help. Verse 23. 23? Huh. Here we are on day count of 50 and 1 in the year 2023. And we just saw 22, and 22 is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's where the revelation kicks off. Right with God destroying the United States of America at the rapture. The rapture happens in chapter 4, verse 1 of Revelation. We're in chapter 22, or the, the book with 22 chapters in it, meaning light and revelation, in verse 22 here. Verse 23. But whoso offereth praise glorifieth me in the year 2023. And to him that ordereth his conversation aright, I will show the salvation of God. That word right there is Yeshua. Isn't Jesus the salvation of Yah? Yeah. In 2023, I'll show you Jesus, if you'll believe. If you don't, I'm going to show you the book of Revelation, baby, by way of water and fire. I'm going to destroy you. I'll terrorize you. I'll tear you in pieces because you have thrown my word behind. Jesus is the word, guys. You have thrown Jesus behind your back. You've hated Jesus and you've walked on. You walked on top of him. You stomped him in your hatred for him and you walked on. And God says, if you do that, here comes revelation. Here comes some light on you. I'm going to throw down some fire. It's going to terrorize you and rip you to pieces. Verse 23, but whoso offereth praise, that means true praise from your heart, not religion. Before we saw them offering religion, we saw them down there at the temple with their goats and their sheep and their songbook, singing the songs and da-da-da, but their heart wasn't there. And God says, whoso offereth true praise from your heart, you glorify me. And to him that ordereth his conversation aright, that means his life. Your life speaks louder than your words. He's not talking about the words that you speak. He's talking about the life that you live. Obedience. Now, this is going to be, you and I, we are the ones who believe in the conversation of God, his word, and we love him. And so he came to us with the gospel and we have believed the gospel and we have ordered our conversation aright. And we say, okay, for by grace, I've been saved through faith, not by works of righteousness, which I have done. No way, no way. It's all by grace, 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 grace. And I believe grace. Your conversation has just changed at that point. And the Bible says, those that are saved, I will show you the salvation of God. I will show you Jesus. And he's going to save us and call us the congregation of the righteous. And even those who miss the rapture, if you'll hear my voice and the, and the preachers who are preaching the sermon I'm preaching today, that even after the rapture, if you will order your conversation aright, even in the year 2023, when Sean comes back, he is one of the two witnesses and he's preaching to you the gospel. You believe God will take care of you. You just keep listening to the preachers. And God will get you in hiding, and God will preserve your life. Stir your conversation aright. Listen to the word. Don't stomp the word. Don't throw the word behind your back, but you believe in the word. His name's Jesus, and he wants to save you. Will you believe? Will you reread and meditate on Psalm 1, for this is the first day of the olive count, and will you reread and meditate on Psalm 50, for this is the 50th day of the grape count, the wine. This is it. We will never have another wine count again before the rapture, we truly believe. And we've just started the last of the oil count today, this very day. And God very well may rapture us in the oil and bring Sean back in the oil because Sean is the oil. Think about these things, meditate on these things, and get your heart right with the Lord today. Get everything out of your wicked heart because the heart's wicked. Desperately wicked, deceived and deceiving. 
Get everything that the world puts into your heart, the wicked conversation, get it gone. Quit stopping and starting and waiting and standing and sitting with the wicked and wicked things, wicked ideologies, wicked everything around. Everything that's not of the Bible is wicked. Get that out of your heart. Get that out of your meditations. Get that off your bucket list. Your bucket list is wicked. You start doing the will of God. We have a few days left. My heart and my prayer in this sermon is that you'll have an awful lot of crowns to throw at Jesus' feet. And what's the key, guys? Let me tell you the key behind having crowns is living 100% for Jesus. If you'll live 100% for Jesus, every day, every thought, every word, every step, every time you go get water, you're thankful to him and your blessings. Lord, our water is toxic. It's poison. I believe that by faith. I see what's going on around me. You've given me eyes to see. I need you to bless it, please. God will be honored in the fact that you need him to bless your food, that you need him to bless your water, that you understand this truth. That you walk with him, that you read with him, that you sing with him, that the meditations of your heart are only him. You'll be getting all your crowns. And we encourage you to do that and rejoice in him out of a heart of praise, not out of a heart of religion. God hates religious practices. There's so many people who went to independent Baptist churches today who have no praise in their heart for the Lord. They love this life. They love this world. They love everything about them in this world. And they're going to miss out on their reward. They might be saved but their conversation hasn't been turned to right. We're encouraging you to read your Bible and have your conversation, your life turned to right, and you will see the salvation of the Lord. His name's Jesus. Amen. You ready to see Jesus? Yeah. You ready to meet him? You ready to, are you excited about being able to throw crowns at his feet because you did what he said and you, you knew that he would come through with that? If you lived 100% for Jesus, he would have give you crowns that you could throw at his feet. Do you believe that? Believe that. Meditate, meditate, meditate. There's two congregations. The unholy, wicked, ungodly one and the righteous one. You must come out of this one. This is the one you're born into. And you must believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ and he'll make you righteous. Then you begin to guide the conversation of your life aright with the word of God through the word of God. Read that thing, meditate on it day and night. God bless you. We love you and by his grace, we'll see you tonight.